Hey, 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 Merry Christmas. This is Cedric Youngleman, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. Thank you so much for checking out my show, where we have philosophical conversations about the economic, societal, and cultural implications of Bitcoin and the future of money. Please make sure that you're subscribed to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube, like that video so that more people see it and hit that notifications button so that you don't miss out on any fresh and new content. This episode with Michael Goldstein, aka Bitstein, in which we discuss his new piece toward a new node world order is brought to you by River Financial. I'm able to produce this show in part thanks to my sponsors, and I'm very selective about who I work with and put in front of you guys, so I hope that you will check them out. Securely buy Bitcoin and purchase hosted mining rigs at river.com. I've been using River for over two years because they have incredible customer service, zero fees on recurring orders, and they have impeccable security. I love River because they are a Bitcoin-only company. To get started and find out for yourself, use the link in the show notes and get up to $10,000 free when you buy Bitcoin and miners at river.com. Then get your sats off your exchange. My favorite hardware wallet is the cold card from CoinKite. It's definitely worth learning how to use it. You can also start by transferring your coins to a simple open dime you can keep safe. You can get a 5% discount by using the referral link in the show notes. Experience the freedom and affordability of cash payments and community-funded healthcare with CrowdHealth. Use promo code MATRIX during signup for a special discounted subscription offer. Check out the link in the show notes for more information. Bitcoin 2023 will be back in Miami Beach one more time. Education, celebration, and hyper-Bitcoinization will be once again on the agenda. Join us May 18th to 20th. Use the code MATRIX for 15% off your tickets at b.tc forward slash conference. And now, let's enter the Bitcoin Matrix with Michael Goldstein, where we discuss how Bitcoin obsoletes inflation and promotes human flourishing toward a node world order. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Michael Goldstein, AKA Bitstein, is the founder and president of the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute, a co-host of the Noted Bitcoin Podcast, a software engineer, and he just started the Bitcoin Brief, which is a newsletter focusing on insights into Bitcoin and the future of money and society, drawing primarily from the Austrian economic tradition. Readers will learn about Austrian economics and how it helps us better understand Bitcoin. Readers will also learn about Bitcoin and how it helps us better understand Austrian economics. Bitstein, welcome back to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me again. Yeah, man. I'm super excited to to get back into it. You were on episode 34. Everyone's a scammer, praxeology, how to mean Bitcoin to the moon, and advanced geopolitical mimetic warfare. Covered a lot of ground there. I I almost ended the podcast after that show. I was uh, so excited to, to get to interview you. So yeah, it's definitely great to have you back. Uh, I'd love to get into your new piece, uh, Toward a Node World Order, How Bitcoin Obsoletes Inflation and Promotes Human Flourishing. What got you writing again? How did you get involved with the Bitcoin Times and Svetsky? Yeah, well, I will say, uh, since our interview, it does seem like the uh, you know advanced uh, geopolitical meme craft has uh, worked quite well. We seem to be making some good progress. And I think this this article kind of gets into um, imagining the the forces by which that happens sort of naturally economically. As far as actually writing again, um, it, it's funny because a lot of people think I write a lot because uh, I tweet a lot um, and people, you know, uh, seem to like my tweets, but I'm, I'm mostly a publisher. Um, so most of most of the stuff online um, that I'm associated with, I was I was helping publish, uh, you know, sharing sharing ideas that I thought were very powerful. Um, but I was not doing enough writing myself, and um, quickly realizing that that needs to change, and that's why I started a 
Substack. And uh, yeah, I definitely want to thank Alex Svetsky for, um, you know, getting me to write for the Bitcoin Times. He was putting together the Austrian um, edition, you know, each each uh, edition of the Bitcoin Times. He's he's giving a different theme. And uh, yeah, this year was the Austrian edition. And uh, he, he thought of me when he was putting that together. So he invited me to write for it. And I actually wasn't totally sure what I was going to write about. But um you know, I, I was thinking about the just the the concept of a node and how powerful it is that we can run a full node and just what that means and what it means to live in the society where I can run a node, you can run a node, everyone can run a node. Um, and in fact, everyone has to run a node if they want to truly be plugged into the Bitcoin system. And um, it kind of it kind of went from there. And uh, yeah, I was I was able to put out an article that I'm you know I'm pretty proud of it, and uh, I think people have really enjoyed it so far, and uh, it's encouraged me to want to do more writing. Um, so uh, I hope <laughs> I hope that comes to fruition. Yeah, I do as well. I mean, I think you have a really interesting take. I also think about you know the the noted podcast now toward a node world order, and just the connection there, and I think about. When I was my conversation with Matt O'Dell, where he said he was he was going where other people weren't with privacy, and it seems like you're going where other people aren't going with with a node. Um, before we get into the piece, though, quick update, quick question. So you know you, you mentioned uh, the memetic warfare and how to main Bitcoin to the moon, and, and we're doing some pretty good work there. Uh, what about the other piece? Everyone's a scammer. Is everyone still a scammer? What, what do you think I... in, in the year 2022? <laughs> I think it's never been clear that uh, everyone's a scammer. Uh, the 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 level of scamming is just uh, sky high. Um, unfortunately, uh, I wish it weren't the case, but it's it's uh, part of the reality that we have to deal with. And um, if anything, I think it fits right into the the theme where um, this is exactly why you need to run a full node uh, because it's the one you know, source of truth that you can rely on because everything outside of that, as soon as you step outside of your own node and your own keys, you're dealing with a very chaotic, uh, you know, uh, epistemic landscape, you know, um, everywhere you turn, you know, there's misinformation, disinformation, and, and uh, not necessarily from the uh, sources uh, you would be told uh, are offering that, but, you know, everywhere we turn, we're, we're dealing with, you know, just an information landscape where, where we can't trust as many people as, as we may have felt like we could in the past. And um, you really have to um, have the courage to, you know, work through all of these uh, problems yourself, which that it, that also kind of you know ties into the the, the full node. It's almost like uh, we have to become full nodes on on more things than we uh, we originally thought. Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes I like to think of the everyone's a scammer in, in the good connotation, where even good people have their agenda and maybe their motives. And I think it's good to kind of think adversarially and um, you know. But then there's the, the the dark side of it, which is you know the FCBFs and and the lunas and the Celsius. And I've just been blown away by, you know, even being forewarned by even just the the size and, and uh, the depth of, of some of these, um, what are just straight crimes. But uh, turning to uh, the piece, who, who was the original toxic maximalist? Well, uh, so I, I wrote a uh, piece on my sub stack about this. So I, I named the great eminent economist Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises as the uh, original toxic maximalist. Um, and I'm willing to bet that I'm totally wrong about that. We can, you know, trace back in time other other great toxic maximalists, but it was a, a it fits into the the broader theme of um, the the article, which, you know, I, I got into Bitcoin after I got into Austrian economics, which, you know, I've, I've later found out that this is you know, this isn't how most people were. It's like maybe some of the early people that was that was kind of a a crowd that Bitcoin um, attracted in the beginning. But generally speaking, um, people have gotten into Bitcoin and then found an interest in economics. They whatever it is draws them to to Bitcoin. Whether it's just the number go up, whether it's because they're a technologist, you know, it, it really whatever it might be, it draws them in. But then 
it quickly has people asking that seminal question of what is money. Um, and so people start going down that rabbit hole. My point is um, that, you know, it, it's, it's impossible for any, any of us to like truly understand Bitcoin, you know, it's impossible for us to truly understand, you know, any, any whole system. Um, we just don't have a, a, a mind capable of that. However, um, we can use traditions, you know, academic and intellectual traditions that have already existed um, to actually help guide us. And I think the Austrian school in particular stands out as a school of thought that is not as shaken by Bitcoin as the other ones. Um, in fact, where, you know, and, and I hope to write about this later on, but where, um, where Austrian economics sometimes falls short on the Bitcoin question, is actually usually indicative of someone not taking its own tenets seriously enough. That is to say, um, taking the idea of subjective value and uh, marginal utility, et cetera, et cetera, taking those seriously enough um, to um, see how Bitcoin actually fits in. Um, so with all that being said, uh, when we look back at the work of Ludwig von Mises, who, you know, he himself was was standing on the shoulders of giants um, from people like uh, Menger and Bomba Work and, uh, uh, you know, many centuries of, of economic thought before that. But, you know, he kind of coalesced everything into a, a really fine, you know, whole theory of, of what economics is and how money works and how it fits in. And with that, his his theories of money are just so spot on um, when we look at Bitcoin. Um, I, I think if you just had to, you know, take Bitcoin to someone in in history and, you know, who, who would actually grok it the most, I think Ludwig von Mises would be the one who would, you know, it'd probably take him a little bit to understand computers. Um, but as far as the actual economics of the system, um, he would he would get it immediately, and I think he would uh, really uh, he'd really like it. Uh, I think he'd be he'd be one of us. And furthermore, th so that's the the monetary side of things. He makes a very compelling case for why um, a market converges on a single monetary good and why the powers of monetary unification are so strong. Um, and so he makes he makes a very compelling case for that. And of course, he was a, a very strong proponent of, um, you know, uh, the gold standard, um, basically as the, you know, analog uh, Bitcoin mm -hmm. standard uh, before we had better monetary technologies. And uh, but beyond that, I also point out how, um, you know, he was a market maximalist. He he took the the tenets of of the free market very seriously, and he was not afraid to point out how what he called a middle of the road policy is is simply giving into socialism, just maybe not at a fast pace. Um, you know, very much uh, uh, Michael Malice, a uh, internet troll and commentator, he he talks about how progressive or conservatism is progressivism driving the speed limit. And I think what he's describing there is actually very similar to to what Mises was talking about with middle of the road policy, because um, when people stray a little bit from just having a very strong free market, private property, um, you know, ethos, you are opening the floodgates to be able to um, rationalize all kinds of interventions that just begin to permeate the entire market economy. So as soon as you start saying it's okay to intervene on this one thing, well, because maybe maybe something's too expensive. So you intervene to want to um, put a price cap on something. But when you do that, there's other market changes and so and and ways that the market responds to that. And so that same person, if they if they allowed themselves to give into that, why would they not then allow themselves to say, well, the next uh, piece of the the sort of uh, supply chain, is also demonstrating this thing. So we also need to intervene there. 
and then so on and so forth. And the dominoes fall and suddenly, you know, you're intervening on the whole of the market, the entire supply chain, the entire structures of production. And when you've got in there, you're, you're in the same uh, socialist economy, just, you know, one step at a time. So he was a, a market maximalist and was not afraid to um, stick to his guns on um, taking that principled position on we can't give in to any intervention. And obviously, you know, we can imagine all kinds of analogs with Bitcoin in the way that we we do not, uh, you know, give an inch on decentralization. Um, we do not give an inch on our ability to run full nodes and hold keys. That doesn't mean that everyone follows that, but we don't give an inch on uh, giving people the ability to do so um, if they if they choose to take that level of uh, responsibility for themselves, which I argue they should. Finally, you know, I talk about how Ludwig von Mises uh, was also just plain toxic uh, in the way that, uh, you know, Bitcoiners get, get um, you know, called that pejorative. Um, there was a, a famous case. I, I really just love uh, the story every time I hear it. But um, he was at the original Mont Pelerin Society, which was um, a gathering of the sort of leading free market economists um, of the time, and they were discussing, you know, how to how, how do we how do we promote a private property free market, you know, um, system to counter all of the um, basically totalitarian, um, you know, moves that have been happening so far in the 20th century and that they were foreseeing to continue. So this was in 1947. And uh, so they're there. There's like Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek. And then there's Mises. And you think Mises would get along great. Um, but at some point he's sitting there and they're discussing, um, you know, something about uh, like a, a tax rate, you know, oh, well, you know, instead of, uh, you know, 5% taxes, we should have 2% taxes, you know, some something like that, really uh, inane discussions. Um, and Mises realizing it's like, well, why are we allowing this idea of uh, being able to tax like that? Like, why are we speaking of this in this framing like this is okay? He stood up and uh, said, you're all a bunch of socialists and stormed out. Um, and I just love that. You know, my, my uh, point is that uh, Bitcoiners should not be afraid to stand up and say you're all a bunch of shit coiners if you have uh you know people who are are trying to change the frame of the dialogue um so that we're not talking about you know things that actually matter uh, but but moving it towards creating one of these grifts and one of these scams um and so you know just tying all that together um i guess uh, you know the last point I made was how um, Mises, uh, everything about him, and people can go read for s some of the more details. And I highly recommend checking out his biography. Um, you know, there's there's a thousand page biography if you want to read that, but also just um, kind of generally his just you know his Wikipedia page or whatever. Very fascinating life where he escaped from the Nazis. He was he was from a noble family, you know, hence the Vaughn in his name. He. Um, he he had eminent positions in Austria, um, in like the the Chamber of Commerce and such. Um, but when he got to America after fleeing, he was basically working out of out of a closet. He was relying on philanthropic funds um, to to stay afloat, and uh, he he had a quote visiting professor role. But like I said, he was just working out of closet. But he had some uh, informal seminars that uh, people like uh, Murray Rothbard and others attended. And, um, you know, the, the seeds of some some great revival of the Austrian tradition um, came out of that. And, um, you know, he had he had found himself in a place where, you know, especially with the, the way that the, the tides of the economy had gone, where the, the world had turned towards like an extreme interventionist mindset, the gold standard by time he was by time he died, the gold standard was gone completely. And um, he. Basically, the, the the world conspired to make him irrelevant, right? Um, and yet, despite that, um, his star continues to rise, and he's become more and more important over the years. And you know what I'm arguing is that his ideas actually help us better understand Bitcoin, such that the more important Bitcoin is, the more important it is to understand Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises, because it's through 
uh, his economic thought and the the wider tradition around um, that sort of Austrian Misesian thought that I think we're best able to comprehend how this thing works at, as money and why this is functioning at all, why we're advancing in, you know, geopolitical meme craft and, you know, taking over the world. So, um, yeah, that's that's my my spiel on Mises. Um, people can go read the the full article, but uh, that's kind of my high level summary. Yeah, I mean, you touched on a lot of the points I wanted to get at. So that was fantastic. You know, every time I hear that kind of viewpoint and learning about Austrian economics, I mean, I have a bachelor's of science in finance, a master's of science in accounting from some of the finer schools in the country. And I didn't hear about Austrian economics till I learned about Bitcoin. And yeah, I mean, my my only like uh, finance background or, you know, economics background is I got a bar mitzvah certificate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's about all I know about finance. So, right. um, well, I, I was lucky to get into it early. I, like, I found I found Mises and Rothbard in high school, and uh, that that worked out very well for me. Yeah, I, I love it because you know it's against the grain thinking. But I'm I'm kind of offended that in colleges and universities they don't even present another viewpoint or option. Um, they don't. I mean, they didn't even say we were learning about Keynesian economics or Keynesian economics. It just it was economics it's just disheartening that it's not even brought up at all. Um, I wonder if Satoshi <laughs> yeah. studied Austrian economics and if he had a favorite uh, Austrian economist. Uh, I think that'd be fascinating. Turing, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, I mean, I, that's that's an interesting, you know, point of, point of speculation. I don't get the sense that he was necessarily like a hardcore Austrian, um, although I the Austrians were known among the cypherpunks. So if he, he was indeed from the cypherpunk milieu, um, there's a high high likelihood that, you know, he had at least come across the the works of Hayek and, and Mises. Um, but, you know, we'll never know, but it, it almost, it, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it all convert good, good monetary engineering was, was like had to, you know, converge with what we understand to be good money, because that's the only way you would have succeeded in engineering a good money. Right. I just wonder if he came at it from money or even just engineering and he had to discover, you know, which one he had to discover, maybe. Um, I want to read a quote from Mises that you, that, that you put in the article. Perpetual vigilance on the part of the citizens can achieve what a thousand laws and dozens of alphabetical bureaus with hordes of employees never have and never will achieve the preservation of a sound currency. And you can sort of hear the absolutism in there. Um, what is the primordial state of man in relation to, say, land and technology? Yeah, so this is, you know, getting into my article. And to, to preface this, you know, a, a big point of the article is how what Bitcoin gives us in the form of full nodes and private keys and you know all, all of the you know technological benefits and its economic parameters and all of that what it gives us it it fundamentally improves our ability to uh in, it, you know in, engage with society like our, our productive capacity greatly improves when we have a better money because money is what powers the division of labor in the first place so you know, I I begin the article by just pointing out that the primordial state of man is just poverty. You know, the the world is a very unforgiving place. Nature is very unforgiving. You know, there's a lot of romanticization about different things. You know, returning to nature in some way, and I certainly appreciate and empathize, and you know, many times agree with that. But I still like to remember it's like, you know, the 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 world is uncaring in the sense that, you know, if you, if you go out into the wild, uh, you know, it doesn't care if you live or die. Um, and so it's up to man to be able to, you know, use our reason um, to be able to um, identify means to put towards the ends we have so that we can have nice things, you know, whether it's, you know, at the very beginning, just to get shelter and food. Um, but as we, as we develop, so we can get, you know, things like medicine and, um, you know, fun, fun technology that helps us communicate better, um, like what we're using right now. Um, we have to do that. And 
at every step of the way, we are constrained um, by uh, the resources that we have and the actual means that we can comprehend to use. Um, there's, there's, you know, physical, literal constraints. So like, um, you know, a, a pharaoh in ancient Egypt had a lot of slaves doing a lot of things for him, but because they didn't have enough technological development, no matter how much he would want something like an iPhone, it just simply wasn't going to happen. Instead, that comes through, um, you know, long-term capital accumulation. So, you know, I reference uh, a Hans Hermann's uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe essay where he talks about this, you know, what he calls the Malthusian trap, which is basically going back to Malthus, which, you know, I, I, I have not personally read uh Malthus um so I don't know you know we, we when we when that name usually comes up we think of like a a world economic forum type person who's um you know oh these Malthusians they want to reduce the population but um when we're talking about this we're not talking about a you know normative desire to uh you know match some you know uh capacity uh like them instead we're simply recognizing that given a piece of land and given a certain amount of you know uh basically capital technology there's only so much you know so so many resources you can get out of that piece of land and that's sort of the malthusian trap we that we were stuck in until the industrial revolution um where for whatever reason, um, there's there's many you know theories as to why it was not until the industrial revolution, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that the industrial revolution gave us the ability to produce new kinds of technology um, to improve not only capital accumulation in terms of the tools we have, but also to use the same amount of resources in more um, intelligent ways more more uh you know efficient more uh productive ways so that we can get more out of uh what we have um and so that allows this you know kickstarting of basically getting out of this trap and so you know you can see starting you know in the industrial revolution and of course this 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 scares uh people of various political uh flavors but you know the population just you know absolutely skyrockets and um you know we can we can have our complaints about like right now, you know, I would be one of the first to argue that uh, the the food quality is not what it ought to be um, when it comes to actually feeding all of these people. But the actual ability that we could even um, get to a place to have that conversation um, was only possible because we had these uh, technological improvements. And I, I would argue that now we need to, you know, use, use our reason to, um, you know, uh, do a little bit more of that. I, I want, um, I, I, I want more um, wealth. Uh, I, I think like I, I, I want a better society. You know, I want I want more uh, technology and more more capacity to improve my uh, material well-being, just like pretty much everyone else. But even within that, I, I argue that we've almost been stuck in this sort of, you know, fiat trap where we have we've had certain tools available for you know, the, the, that monetary coordination, but it was always riddled with attack vectors that allow sort of a, a, a parasitic growth along with actual like real economic growth. Um, and so, you know, the, the rest of the article is describing how uh, Bitcoin improves upon this. And then I believe unleashes, you know, our, our capacity as a society to, um, improve beyond where we had been able to by kind of removing some of these like uh fiat drains these monetary drains that we've had on the system right the monetary drains it's a fascinating way to look at it i, I want to turn a little bit to the state and and public support and violence does violence alone account for the success of the state uh yeah so 
violence uh, is a necessary tool. I mean, that's kind of the the whole point is that the state operates, you know, not through productive means, um, which means that it's actually creating wealth and providing value to others. The state operates um, almost basically definitionally um, through um, expropriation and redistribution and almost by definition, that's that means that they are engaging in things that people don't actually want. Well, and how do you get things you, that people don't want? You, you know, use violence against them um, to sort of um, impose your will onto them. That being said, brute force only goes so far. So at some point, you know, uh, th there, there is a limit to how much brute force you can even apply in the first place. So you, you can't rely on it to, to continue forever. Um, the, the state is kind of necessarily a um, minority in terms of sort of the, you know, economic output. Um, I guess, I mean, it's kind of the opposite of an economic output, but it's always going to be a sort of uh, minority in the economy. And so um, brute force alone is not really uh, a good enough explanation for why the state continues. And instead, we have to consider that there is a an element of uh, public ideology or public opinion um, that goes into it. So if the state has the capacity to convince um, some proportion of the economy that what they're doing is actually good and good for them and that they need them, um, such that, you know, Good example is how many times uh, a libertarian might bring up their views and someone asks, uh, well, who would build the roads? Um, that people have been um, taken so far uh, down this this path of, of believing in the necessity of this uh, violent monopoly that uh, without them, it's impossible to figure out how to, uh, you know, lay down some asphalt and move between A and B. Um, so there's there's the extent to which they need to convince people to be sort of true believers. And then they also just need a, a large enough population that simply um, uh, either does not care or um, basically doesn't really think that there's much they can do about it anyway. And so they just have to kind of go along with it. There needs to be that, that level of um, complacency and ap apathy um, that has to exist. And uh that that's all, all of this ties together in this this need to um, engage in various forms of propaganda to help shape that public opinion about the organization so it can perpetuate itself. I guess in that regard, is most of that through the mechanism of money and banking or should we expand on that? Yeah, well, so money and banking is basically the ultimate, uh, you know, source of revenue uh, for the state. You know, that that's the thing that the state most wants to be able to monopolize. Um, that being said, it's not it's not the the first and it's not the only thing that the state is going to monopolize. First and foremost, the state would want to monopolize um, law and security. Um, if you can if you can uh, make yourself the single provider of law, then you are the one who gets to decide uh, what is the correct you know, allocation of resources um, and have it always be in your favor. If it's, uh, if you're able to um, enforce security, well, then uh, like monopolize security, well, then if someone tries to defend themselves against uh, your decision about how my resources should be allocated to you, uh, then th they'll be able to uh, prevent you from stopping them, uh, prevent you from preventing them. So, that's sort of sort of first, you know, kind of laying the groundwork. Um, but also they they need uh, effectively to monopolize anything that can uh, call their legitimacy into question. So um, you know, anything that can uh, compete with certain aspects of the state are going that they're going to want to squash those as much as possible. Because if you realize like, oh, the state uh, does not provide this good, you know, like protection as good as, you know, some some other privately owned um, entity or yourself, then uh, well, why do we have this thing again? Um, it, it gets you gets you uh, asking some questions you're not supposed to ask. 
so so there's all sorts of you know communication type things the roads you know all, all these different um services and there's there's all kinds of you know other you know deep reasons why um you know different things are going to be targets of monopolization but that's sort of the 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 broad brushstroke trend um and i think the other big one and we kind of touched on this earlier was education um because if you can uh get the children from when they're very young and you teach them about how great you are and how necessary you are and um they only get an a in the class and they only get to have a a good life and go to college if they get that a and um in in history by saying that the you know that the government saved us from all the bad things um and it was all the evil you know capitalists or you know whoever else um that was causing all the harm but think think uh, God for the state for saving us from all these things. Um, you're going to have a pretty high success rate at um, getting people to um, believe in that ideology, and and frankly, they're like like you said, you're not even going to hear other uh, other ways of thinking, um, and so um, people, uh, broadly speaking, won't even have the um, capacity to ask those questions in the first place. Um, so that's a good way to um, maintain and expand the high public opinion of a, uh, you know, expropriative uh, firm like the state rather than, you know, productive entities that actually uh, produce wealth and value for people. Yeah, wow. Um, that kind of brings us, I think, to the I mean, what is the productivity theory of wages? So that was uh, that. That's an idea that was put forth by um, an economist named George Reisman, and that's effectively saying that people like as as the economy grows, and this is kind of like assuming you have a a, a good money, then when you. Uh, Every dollar that you earn or every you know unit of money that you earn increases in value such that it can you know sort of necessarily fetch more goods on the market. So when when productivity increases because you have new tools and you have uh, more tools, so more things can be produced um, with the same amount of labor, that means that the the labor that was put in, the the payment for that you know the the wages not necessarily in nominal terms uh but in real terms each unit can fetch more consumer goods so you know i i was giving the example of um child labor which is something that you know is extremely unpleasant in its former form um you know in terms of you know what people imagine with the industrial revolution some of the really nasty stuff that you know i'm so glad that we don't have the question, of course, is why don't we have it anymore? And we want to properly understand that so that we don't attribute uh, the success to the wrong thing. But, um, you know, in a broad brushstroke, um, generally speaking, I, you know, I, I think that it's hard to want to uh, send a child to go work into a, in, a, in a factory. I, I don't I don't know if I have the capacity to even uh, share the mind with someone who thinks that's like a a good idea necessarily uh maybe like a, a ron swanson type um but generally speaking you know we don't we don't like the idea of five-year-olds um having to use their little hands to uh use uh dangerous machinery or whatever and i i assume that most parents were like that in the past too um however there was so little like actual just physical goods like i said earlier like you know before I, when was the you know, you know, let's say like, you know, 1870, it doesn't matter how much you work, you're not going to have electricity in your home. <laughs> it just, it, it doesn't matter how, because there just, there isn't enough stuff, including, you know, like uh, knowledge and all of that to produce such a thing. But as you increase the productivity and as you create these better things, uh, those same dollars that you are earning can now fetch more things in the marketplace such that, over time, um, people can uh, know that their 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 savings and the the wages that they're earning can actually go and get enough to not need to send that kid to the factory anymore. 
And so, uh, you know, the, the argument that he makes and a lot of, um, you know, Austro libertarian types make is that, uh, Broadly speaking, it was the market that got us out of these really bad situations because of the fact that effectively this, you know, producti productivity theory of wages, as people can now afford to have these things that were not previously available, they no longer need to rely on additional sources of income. Um, unfortunately, I mean, we kind of see the opposite happening uh, these days. Um, I think, you know, late stage fiat is kind of an unraveling of this this progress such that, uh, you know, more more people feel the need to uh, do even more and more work. Um, and, uh, you know, thankfully, we're not to the point where we're feeling the need to send children back to factories. Um, but people are definitely feeling um, pain, I think, from this this sort of stagnation of of wages that we've seen for the past 50 years. Yeah, um, I think we've kind of described the fiat world order. And and I think you've walked us through the three steps to that world order in terms of territorial violence, monopoly of money and, and redistribution of wealth to reward supporters and punish detractors. In, in that regard, have the fiat makers just mastered externalizing those costs to the slaves themselves via inflation and taxation? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's like one of the key things with inflation. That's why we call it sort of a, a hidden tax or like a stealth tax um, is because of the fact that, you know, it's it's much more cunning to be able to just print money, to just counterfeit money, uh, gives you the ability to effectively take small amounts of money from all holders of a money rather than actually having to show up at their doorstep with a gun uh, asking them to pay up their their taxes. Um, so I, I don't know the exact numbers, but my understanding is, uh, you know, the, the government gets way more money from inflation than it does taxes. And if any, and I mean, they, of course, could just print all the money they want. So in a sense, like the taxation is almost just this, uh, you know, annual humiliation ritual we have to go through um, just to, you know, remind us who's in charge um, because, you uh, once again, the, the public opinion comes in. As far as, you know, monopolizing the money, um, I, I also reference a, a different Hans Hermann Hoppe essay where he talks about this this process of what it takes to actually to actually monopolize the money. Because once again, I mean, these are these are not things that people would want. Um, people people don't want to see their savings go away. Um, people naturally gravitate towards a money um, that can be useful for um you know hedging against uncertainty not just in the short term but also in the long term and, and all of that so what he points out is it's it's kind of a it happens step by step they kind of chip away at the natural order of money by by through through uh various you know legal means you know kind of violent uh legal means or through uh, kind of the, the the public opinion thing. So the first step is monopolizing um, mints. Um, so um, in this, I, I describe why mints are actually useful, um, but uh, they're able to monopolize. Mints create this sort of central uh, point of failure for a first like a, a gold standard. And um, by monopolizing it, you can you can shift people's perception of money um, from being this you know global monetary standard to a more national form of money that we associate with a particular sovereign um, rather than just you know the, the the gold itself. So instead of instead of the weight of the mm -hmm. the coin, we're thinking about the the, the face on it. Mm -hmm. um, so that that step one is being able to monopolize. Um, the mint um, to to take over, and that that also gives uh, capacity to do coin clipping and and change the composition of coins without people uh, recognize it. And we we can get into some of that if you want later. But second step is once you've done that, you um, encourage the use of money substitutes, and you even go so far as to institute legal tender 
which in fact forces people to use money substitutes. Now, money substitutes in the form of a, you know, just a money certificate where it's like, you know, this this uh, piece of paper represents this much gold. That's a very useful thing. Um, and it would be, people would want to use it in the market for various reasons. Um, but when you force people to use it, you make people use banknotes more than they otherwise would. And uh, legal tender, you know, kind of, that that's the the sort of coup de gras where it just, you know it forces you will now be using uh, basically paper notes, and finally he he describes how once you've gotten everyone to use paper notes, you can finally you know cut the ties to the commodity money altogether, um, the commodity money that people naturally gravitated towards um, because that was that was the sort of natural money that people chose um, for for all the reasons that people actually need money. Um, and once you've once you've cut that off, they also establish uh, central banks and such. And when you've gotten to this point, you can counterfeit money um, as much as you want. They at this point have been able to uh, partner with the banks. Uh, it's something that people I think don't quite understand is like a bank doesn't necessarily want to team up with the state immediately. Like you know, from day one, th the banks actually you know they they're getting forced into a situation they don't like. However, if you then grant them the ability to um, print money for themselves by lending out money, um, then you've you've effectively uh, won them over by, by paying them off with the cancel on effect effectively. Um, so if you say, you know, yeah, we're gonna print all this money, uh, but you'll get the newest uh, units, well, then, you know, you, you obviously uh, benefit at the expense of others and, you know, they they sort of then shift teams from, you know, wanting to maintain, you know, a, a strong market position to wanting to um, be in the uh, coffers of the state. Yeah, I mean, you laid all that out exceptionally well. Uh, in regards to that, then, is there, are there any barriers to the monopoly of money uh well, the monopoly on money by the state. So there are, and I mean, gold. I mean, gold held held on as long as it could, and you know, there there was no reason why we couldn't have had a global uh, gold standard that you know worked uh, well. However, uh, you know, I, I saw what well, I don't remember the the tweet exactly that I was responding to, um, uh, but but there's this idea that it's like you know, it it wasn't the gold standard itself that led to where we are now. And my point was that uh, effectively, you know, the the banks um the, the the banks were the attack vector. Like socialism itself was the attack, but banks and and gold effectively was the attack vector. And we come to this conclusion by thinking about you know, where are the failures of various monetary systems um, at being able to kind of be this bulwark against the state. So as far as like gold and historically, it it did a good job for a while in the sense that you can't just print more gold. Um, and it took a long time for them to get to the point where they could kind of like basically do that, you know, in the 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 20th century you know really unleashed it with with central banking although people were still doing it in the 19th century it, it was just more localized and not as systemic um but obviously banks had their own bank notes and they could cheat and i mean people have <laughs> uh, you know i've said before that you know if if you can't print money people will print money um and so so we saw that but central banking you know <laughs> put it on steroids um but yeah, I mean, gold gold has a very low um, supply growth, and um, generally states could only print as much as they had. Like there's there's a certain limit they could do, and anytime there's any kind of you know bank run, it can all fall fall apart. Um, you know, uh, when people people talk about um, executive order six one zero two a lot, where uh, ownership of gold was made illegal. And something I find interesting, people actually don't really talk about this as much, I don't think, um, which is, you know, why was that happening in the first place? And mm. it was happening because the government ran out of gold. And so they needed to steal all the gold 
um, so they could print more money because it still did act as a bulwark to some extent against um, the state increases. My point here is we should take a sober look at gold. You know, I was a former gold bug. You know, before I was into Bitcoin, I was I was a gold maximalist. Um, but you have to take a sober look about, you know, at, at gold, what it offers and where it falls short. And this process of monopolization, what I describe in the article is, you know, why why, um, for instance, why a mint would arise in the first place and why then that's a good target for state intervention. So a, a mint is a very useful thing because gold has its limits um, for uh, saleability or marketability as, you know, as, as, as Menger talks about, like its ability to transact over, you know, dimensions of time and space um, and scale. And with mints, for instance, one of the problems with gold is um, how do you determine if something's real gold? This is something that, you know, has has been a question, you know, since forever. If I remember correctly, you know, Archimedes, you know, it's like it, it was, you know, the the water and the, like the density, you know, the eureka moment was realizing, you know, OK, well, this this uh, element will have, you know, this density so I can use, you know, um, that as one proxy for trying to um, determine if the gold is real or not. Uh, so a, a mint is effectively uh, someone who does that process for you. And what they produce is a, you know, a coin or a bar that meets a very specific standard. It has a branding on it. It has things on it that help you, you know, see that it, it hasn't been tampered with. So it has like tamper proof. So that's like, you know, the ridges on a coin. Um, you can see that people haven't shaved it. And and that's that's very useful because the alternative to that is to have a gold full node. And what is a gold full node? Well, a gold full node is having, you know, a, basically a giant furnace and you melt down every piece of gold that you get down to its, you know, liquefied form. You measure the pure amount of gold and then you have to recast it into a coin or a bar or whatever that people would actually want on the marketplace. Um, that's expensive. It takes a lot of technical knowledge. Uh, it's very difficult. It's all the things that people uh, complain about with Bitcoin full nodes. That it's like too hard to do, but it's it's actually very easy to run a full node ultimately. And it's certainly certainly in comparison. So that that's what you have to do to actually have certainty that what you're dealing with is is real gold and. You ultimately have to do that with every single transaction. So coins and coinage is a very useful tool um, for dealing with that. You can you can have these standard, uh, you know, weights. So it's like you know this coin is an ounce. Um, I can I can just trust. Like I know this is like I know the branding. I know this is a good coin. I know they're good uh, for what they claim. Um, so I'll, I'll go with that. Like you know the the London gold bars or sort of the the gold standard of gold bars. So so that's very useful, right? But that also creates this attack factor. Now a, a state has a or you know they they have a a desire to have a mint even without wanting to do something nefarious because they themselves have a a desire to just have their own full node and others can benefit from that, right? So the problem, though, is once someone has that, well, people have now shifted from thinking about the gold as such to these coins. So it's like, OK, well, this has the queen's face on it, so it's good, as as opposed to thinking about like, well, at its foundational chemical composition is this uh, what what we think it is. And that like I said, it shifts people into a viewing money as a national thing um, rather than um, a commodity, you know, global commodity standard. It also opens up the door for uh, malicious behavior because now someone else is, you know, doing the verifying for you. And because of that, you don't know that they're handing you a, a fake coin. So, they get a seniorage when they mint the coin because the coin goes out at a premium because they had to, you know, 
put in the work to to do that. And so they sell it at a certain price people were willing to pay. Um, but then if the money comes back through them, they can melt it down, change the composition mm -hmm. so they can make it a, an alloy um, uh, and, and uh, recast it, but send it out as if it's the same thing as it was. And so now they have more gold and they've effectively um, defrauded people and earned an extra seniorage from that. Um, and so that that immediately is, you know, a, a demonstration of a a thing that is actually kind of useful on the market, but opens itself as an attack vector to various malicious um, behaviors. And uh, Bitcoin fixes this because Bitcoin has no need for this. We just run a full node, which does all of this stuff all in one. And it does it every 10 minutes. Uh, it does it perfectly. It does it with extreme rigor. Um, and in fact, it, it does it even better than any gold, uh, you know, assayer can do, because not only can we know that, uh, you know, every, every unit of Bitcoin that we receive is valid and every Bitcoin that we send is actually from us so that we know that we're not using counterfeit money. We can we can know that, which is amazing. That's something that no one else could do before um, to, to this scale. But on top of that, uh, we also know how many Bitcoin there are total. No one knows how many dollars there are. Nobody knows how, many, how much gold there is. But we know exactly how much Bitcoin there is. And that gives us strong assurances about um, our ownership of a good relative to the network as a whole. Um, which helps us do better, you know, economic planning and calculation, um, because we kind of have this, this, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, actual calculable uh, perception of the network. Yeah, I mean, lots to unpack there, and I want to get into nodes, but before we turn to nodes, why do you think gold is so primal? It's very shiny. It's very pretty. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's a good question. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it, it's it's a it's a very unique metal. Obviously, um, it has you know a very very distinct color. It's a, and like I said, it's a very pretty color. Um, it has just all of these all of these interesting properties. The way I think about things and like sort of a you know long term arc of history kind of uh you know broad brush strokes idea is that with all these things you know going back to like you know if people can print money people i mean if, if people can't print money they will print money it's kind of the same with any sort of um intersubjective good like money you know um if you can game the monetary system uh and others don't know about how to game it you you get an advantage so my perception of things is that everyone is always kind of like taking the resources they have, these sort of intersubjective resources, and trying to game it in some way um, to to outgame the other people. And gold is this, you know, it's very primal on that. Like it's very, very uh, unique. It's very scarce, etc. And as people are trying to game things, whether they're trying to game beads, game cows, game salt, whatever it might be, gold is just this thing people could not figure out how to game, um, and certainly not on a large scale until, um, you know, basically banking came along. Um, in which case, you know, through through um, the minting process, through uh, through um, you know, the, the money substitutes, et cetera, then you can actually start gaming it at scale. But it, it's this, without all that, like it's, it's, a, it's very hard to game. Um, and so I think that's the sort of primal thing is like all of our, all of our monkey brains are trying to uh, figure out a way to game the system. And gold just has all of these very unique, interesting properties. Um, you know, it's malleability, it's durability, it's, you know, it, all, all these things. Um, and, you know, a bunch of these are, are what people classically point to as, as what makes, you know, a good money. It has all those. Um, and so it's just, it, it holds out over time. And um, I think, 
humans caught on to that uh kind of kind of early um it it, it took a while but it, it eventually took over yeah uh, and when i think about gold i i think about trace mayer and how he described his or he was talking about the civilization in india and how they they pet their gold and over time you just want to have your gold increase and they it really resonated with me. I wish Trace would come back, um, but I, I think of you know my stats. I just I, I'd like to see them increase uh, every day. I have more stats than I had the day yeah, before. Tend to your garden, just uh, you know every right. day. Just get a get a few right. more stats. Plant seeds, not weeds. Um, you know, and, and when I think about nodes, though, and like you you were talking about gold, and you have this furnace, you could kind of I think of that as almost like a partial node. Because you could kind of ascertain or validate what you have, but you you don't know what anyone else has. And I think about right. those. That's a great point. Yeah, and I think about those mints as, you know, those are kind of full nodes over a protocol. So you know, maybe you don't know how much gold is in the world, but you know how much gold is in your minted economy, and, and maybe who's allowed legally to interact with that, or or you know, you could track that in any different way. But you know, it doesn't really explain the whole thing. So I want to get into Bitcoin nodes. And we talked, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask these three questions individually. Like what is a Bitcoin node? Yeah. I, I just want to like round out what you said. Cause that, that's a, that's a really interesting way of, of uh, putting it. Cause it's like, yeah. Uh, Bitcoin then is the first time that we've had a full node. Um, uh, the, the, the gold node would be more of like an SPV thing um, where you, you don't know if other people are double spending or anything. You just know that it's like you, you have what you have. Um, but yeah, a, a full node is a computer that's connected to the Bitcoin network that, uh, verifies transactions and blocks. A full node is a node that, um, has verified the entire blockchain. So the entire Bitcoin history such that it, it has like a, a full, um, understanding of the state of the network. Um, not all of these nodes keep everything. There's something called pruned nodes. So as soon as you've, you know, um, verified certain information that you just don't need anymore because it's it's old and isn't relevant to the current UTXO set anymore, you can discard it if you want. If you don't want to save it, you still know that its output is valid. So as long as you can, you know, maintain that output and and move forward, you you know that it's good. But the important thing is that full node, whether it's pruned or not has gone through every single action on the Bitcoin ledger and uh, verified it down to every last bit. Every little piece of math uh, lines up and that, that full node has checked it. So, you know, one, one way that I describe it is that it's a, uh, you know, it's like your independent bookkeeper. Um, you know, it's, it's your computer that's, you know, doing the accounting on the Bitcoin network and, and it does it perfectly. Awesome. And so then why are they important? Well, they're important because like we've said, you know, everyone is trying to uh, game the monetary network. And the only way that we can get out of that and know that we're safe and sound, that we actually have what we think we have. And in relation to a network that we can actually comprehend that network as a whole, the only way to do that is by running that full node and verifying the whole network and your relation to it. Right. And in what way then can we manifest our will onto the Bitcoin network with the node? Yes, kind of. And so this is like a fun one because when you when you instantiate a Bitcoin node, you are instantiating your own vision of Bitcoin. You can run any node software you want. There's many implementations. Most people use the uh, Bitcoin core. Uh, but even then, there's many versions of it. Uh, but there's, you know, BTCD, there's uh, Bcoin, there's all sorts of uh, different, uh, there's Libitcoin, there's all these different implementations. You can run whatever code you want, call it Bitcoin, whatever. Um, but even with that, you know, there's certain network parameters. You can set whatever you want there. Um, in fact, a lot of the altcoins, you know, it's almost just copy pasting the code, but changing some of those like parameters. So when you instantiate a node, you are instantiating, these are the rules that I agree to. These are the rules I am okay with, you know, consenting to. Um, and I want to be a part of a network that um, 
goes along with these rules. Um, side note, I didn't talk about this in the article, but there are different kinds of rules. Like what I'm speaking of here is specifically consensus rules, meaning the rules that define um, like how, how we what how we agree upon what's a valid block and transaction uh, rather than other rules that, that don't necessarily do that. So um, a, a great example is recently, there has been a lot of drama over um, something called replace by fee RBF. And there's RBF has been uh, a piece of drama for many, many years now for various reasons. Um, but just an important thing to note there is it doesn't matter what people's beliefs about RBF is um, ultimately because the blockchain, it doesn't affect the actual blockchain itself. Um, so, so it, it has more to do with, with how an individual node, uh, looks at a transaction before it's made in, into a block. Whereas the consensus rules are about, is that transaction valid in the first place? And if a block includes it, is that block valid? And those are the rules I'm talking about specifically, not things like RBF or other rules that individuals can have, and it just doesn't matter in relation to other people um, in the in the grand uh, scheme of Bitcoin. Right. With that, right. so sorry. No, you go. Oh, uh, so I was basically going to say that. Um, yeah. So you instantiate your will in the sense of this is what I'm willing to go with. However. There's kind of also the other side of it, which is um, if you just choose a, a set of rules just on a whim or you choose whatever you think uh, is good without thinking about the rest of the network, you might be the only one with that with that set of rules. And so you might be a network of one. So people tend to choose rules. They, they want to choose rules that uh, more people are agreeing to because that's going to give them a more marketable network to work with. If I have if I have Bitcoin, but it turns out it's on this uh, blockchain that only you know five people use because it's this uh, different set of rules. Like it just has some one little variable is slightly off, so it's totally different network. Um, and I go to a store that accepts Bitcoin. I try to spend it and I send it, but that person doesn't receive it. Well, then like. It, you know, you just, you were on the wrong network. You would want to go on the network that you can be reasonably certain that other people are actually going to accept those coins when you go to spend them. Um, and so there's this, this emergent network, you know, out of many nodes, there emerges one network that is most marketable. And this is why, you know, there's many forks of Bitcoin. There's many forks of many forks of all kinds of things, but there's only one Bitcoin network. Um, and people can call any network they want Bitcoin. Uh, but what matters is that um, emergent, you know, uh, order that's uh, created by a particular set of rules that many individuals as individuals have instantiated. Right. That's wild. I think of what Robert Breedlove said in terms of, uh, you know, you could change the game of chess doesn't mean anyone's going to play with you. That's a great but way I, of putting it. Yeah. When I think about nodes and you know i got a lot of this from safedine's work especially the fiat standard and talked about the full node of the fiat system and but i think even within that system you know you could have the mint and the full node the federal reserve and they you know but they they don't know how much money's been counterfeited outside of their purview they don't know maybe how much money's been created in the euro dollars or the stable coin market they don't know when maybe cash has been destroyed or lost Right. So they they can validate and ascertain a lot of things, but it's just not a perfect node. I, I listened to uh, Pierre, uh, you know, our, our great auditor friend, uh, talk about the actual audit process, you know, from from an auditor's perspective, not just, uh, you know, me, the ship poster perspective, like someone who's actually been trained in how auditing works. And he he's trained to know how to audit. He was describing how the uh, yeah, how the Fed is like audited and a lot of these banks are audited and it's really laughable. Um, it, it makes sense, I suppose. Um, I, you know, I'd have to ask him if it's just, is this, is this actually just the best we can do? Um, but if, even if that's the case, like if, if it's because that's just the best that we could do, it just, it's that much worse than Bitcoin. 
it almost it, it makes it even worse because um th that would mean that it's literally the best that we can do like this like we take like these these random samples and we try to just like guesstimate based on that about this whole system whereas you know any any person you know you really don't have to be that technical can get an old laptop download bitcoin core open it up it syncs to the network and it's doing all of that auditing perfectly well with no exceptions and with like um effectively perfect mathematical certainty um you know along with you know the the various you know economic forces of, of proof of work and such but point is is uh, the blocks that you you sync to it's like you you get them perfectly there's no there's there's no room for error if you make one right. bit off you are totally in you know disconnected from the network so uh the the difference there is just so absolutely stark yeah i mean my background's also an audit and uh while i think that industry has its uh, tremendous conflicts of uh in conflicts of interest and i think there's problems that arrive throughout that industry uh what i like about bitcoin is you can run the numbers and you can do a real full audit um it, it's it's really beyond the pale in, in comparison to anything that we have in, in, in the corporate world it was actually one of the reasons i probably felt that fell down the shitcoin rabbit hole for a while because i thought that would help eliminate you know intercompany reconciliation issues and and, and right, triple right. ledger accounting and i had explored that for a little bit to realize that there wasn't much there from outside of money uh the purview yeah, of money that's so interesting so like actually like i mean i, I don't even want to uh you know <laughs> say nasty things about auditors um obviously like certain government agency auditors i have very negative feelings towards but uh um, for the rest of them, and actually including the government ones, um, they should they should leave the government and come be Bitcoiners. Um, mm. But you know, all, all of these auditors should uh, you know learn more about Bitcoin because <laughs> if if they knew how great we can audit things, they would uh, hopefully they they love yeah. it as much as we do. Well, I see most of it as organized crime and just racket, um, <laughs> but that's a whole other uh, show. Um, how does running your own node? Or, or I should say, not how does, does running your own node help the Bitcoin network? It does. Um, but also in a way that I think is is somewhat misunderstood, um, or at least it used to be much more misunderstood. I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I think today there there might be a, a bit of a better understanding of this, and hopefully people will read my article. And if they don't have a good understanding, they can kind of kind of fix that up. But basically... The, the misunderstanding is that um, running a Bitcoin node is just this sort of like altruistic thing that adds security to the network. You spin up a node and it's just like there's there's, you know, a big scoreboard of some sort. And it's like, oh, yes, the Bitcoin network is now more secure because, you know, there's there's a node running. Um, my argument is that we can learn from the Austrian principle of methodological individualism to see where the actual security of the network is arising there. Because I do agree that running a node can help secure the network, but it's not simply because there's a node running. Instead, so first, methodological individualism is this idea that you can't, when we're trying to comprehend something like society or a big group of some sort, the group or society itself does not like have a will. There's not like a will unto itself that you can analyze. Instead, the way the Austrians approach it is say the group is made of people and the the, the group insofar as it seems like it has a will, that's actually the, you know, a, a emergent order of all of the individuals in that group acting in a certain way. So, so it is with, with uh, Bitcoin where, the the Bitcoin network as a whole does not have a will of its own. The Bitcoin network is made up of individuals who have a will and they use Bitcoin um, to to you know <laughs> make make use of that will, like get get stuff out of the world. And um, one of the ways they do that is well, from an individual point of view, if I'm using a money, I want to make sure that I'm not getting gamed, I'm not getting scammed, I'm not getting counterfeit. Uh, counterfeited. I'm not getting double spent. And so how do I do that? Well, I have to run a full node to run all of the numbers. I have to hold my own keys. So I know that, uh, so that I know that I actually have, have custody of, of these units and I'm not trusting you're like reducing all of this, uh, 
you know, third party trust that you need. And so the value of the network or the security of the network comes in the fact that when more people are acting in this self-interested fashion of just wanting to run the numbers for their own security, you know, sake, that adds uh, security to the network because when you use that network, you know that it's it's actually you know having its numbers run. So when I'm I'm looking at the world and it's like which which money should I use? Well, one of the things that you want to look at is like well how well do people run the numbers so that I can know that this is a this is a a network that is is full of people who actually secure the money. And can I run a network? Can I run a node so I can do the same? Um, and so the security of the network, you know, when when people are running more nodes, like we said, it creates more marketability because you know more people will accept, you know, uh, a money of a certain set of network rules and parameters. That's that that's the security. It has more marketability. Um, it has more economic value, which in turn has all sorts of feedback loops in terms of the continued engineering of the protocol, of the tools, of the education efforts, of the knowledge ar around the, the network. Um, but it ultimately comes from individuals saying, I will not accept your money unless it shows up on my full node in the way that I'm expecting. You know, unless it shows up associated with my keys on my full node, you didn't send the money to me. And that's that. And that makes the network more secure. There's not, there's not an overall scoreboard. It is the emergence from everyone acting in that way and demanding that things abide by uh what what is on the full node. Um people should check out I I reference a uh, an article by Stop and Decrypt, where he talks about uh, Bitcoin, you know, the Bitcoin network as an impenet impenetrable fortress of validation. Because when you have this emergence of all these individuals running full nodes, it's so strong that it's it's your node is unlikely to even see an invalid transaction or block because it, if it ever gets to the network, um, it gets rejected by the first node and it doesn't even relay it. So you're unlikely to even be the one to see these invalid things because it becomes so impenetrable in terms of uh, you know receiving invalid things. And once again, that's all coming from the fact that that impenetrable fortress is made up of thousands and thousands of individuals choosing to run nodes and connecting with one another that way and demanding that the the economic value that they're uh, working with on the network has to abide those their own node for themselves, um, and I, I think that's it's it's a very it's a very uh, you know it's it's a very different way of looking at it than thinking you know the Bitcoin network as a whole has this like security number. Um, and if anything, they actually you know it's also it's also more empowering. It's like I'm I'm not running this node because it's like this marginal benefit to the network. I'm running this node because it it's everything to me yeah and it's a, a deep way of looking at it in that regard then to build on that did the invention of bitcoin also invent a new way for humans to make choices um is that is that sorry is that the the question like did it did it give us that ability yeah did it offer us a new way to make choices absolutely um, because never before did we have the the ability to choose to use a money uh, with that kind of certainty. And when you have that that kind of certainty, you can you, you don't have to waste efforts on reducing that uncertainty because you've reduced it all the way. And so now you can you can unlock new ways of of doing things altogether. So before Bitcoin, there wasn't a way, there simply was not a way to choose to send money instantly to someone in like the Congo or something. That that just simply was not a choice. I don't I don't think there was a single you know bank that was going to help uh, make that transaction happen instantly. Um, in fact, I mean most transactions don't happen instantly uh, between. Uh, people in the Western world anyway, because it goes through this whole settlement process. So in that sense, even even with your neighbor, 
unless you handed them physical cash, there was not a way to settle in the banking system instantly. With Bitcoin, because we've unlocked full nodes, that gives us the ability to settle effectively instantly in the grand scheme of things by, by getting some confirmations in a block. And then when that unlocks the ability to have things like, you know, hash time lock, you know, contracts. So we have, you know, lightning channels. Suddenly we can uh, settle it at the speed of light. Um, and so that that's a new thing. We literally could not choose to do that beforehand. And now we can. And so the question is, how much will that manage to unlock? And I, I obviously think um, a lot especially when we consider um not there there's that you know positive side of it that we almost can't even fathom like what what will if if lightning continues on the path it is today where will it be in 10 years like that's that's a big question i don't even know like who knows it's like um we, we see what's happening um in in some of the development of of these technologies now and it's i'm i'm obviously very bullish on that but the other side of it is simply thinking in terms of the opportunity costs of having to deal with a monetary system that drains our economic productivity at <laughs> its own lightning pace. You know, I think Michael Saylor is one of the best uh, kind of voices on this. You know, just kind of <laughs> running his own numbers on um, if if you're wanting these, you know, if 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 you're not wanting to live in the pod and eat the bugs you're having your wealth drained at, you know, what, like, you know, 15% annually or whatever, just constantly. Um, and even on a gold standard, when the supply is increasing at like 2% every year, that's still a 2% drain. Now, the market is better at managing that. Um, so things kind of have that sort of feeling of stability, I suppose, although even that's not really true. But you're you you have that like two percent drain that drag on the economy every single year, and that adds up very quickly. Compounding, you know, uh, the the you know the famous quote about compound interest being the most powerful force in the universe. That's pretty true um, when you really think about these numbers. And so, as far as the 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 choices we get to make, what choices are unlocked when you simply remove that much drag from the economy? What kind of choices would you be able to make in your life if you weren't having 15 or whatever? I mean, it's it's kind of more than that, <laughs> depending on your numbers. I mean, it's all it all depends on the the individual, but we'll call it, you know, 15% or whatever, even 2%, you know, compounded over, you know, a, a decade or two. What would you do with that much more money? That much more savings at your disposal? My guess is you have a lot of things you would come up with that you would want to do with that a lot of a lot of dreams that could be fulfilled a lot of possibilities a lot of security a lot of just a, a lot <laughs> and we can make those choices now because there's no longer that drag so there's there's two sides of that there's one where because we've reduced the need to um to to basically zero about this like uncertainty with the money um and because with the especially with regards to the monetary policy itself, we can now make choices that don't have to take into account that opportunity cost and instead actually like actualize on the, those, those real, you know, economic productivities we have, which also plays into that productivity theory of wages of like, what, what kind of things do we put up with today? I mean, Th thankfully, you know, I, I don't think we're having to deal with uh, children in factories, but like, what are other just like things that we have to deal with? Maybe we don't even realize it because we're, you know, fish swimming in water that we can get rid of. And then on the other side, the choices that we can make is when you've unlocked this idea that you can send money instantly anywhere in the world and it, without using any third party, peer to peer, why that that side it's actually harder to imagine um uh, because we we don't know i mean it's like it's like trying to you know look at the road system and predict how airplanes will go it's just it, it, it's it's hard for us to to kind of uh make those make those predictions but we can also you know probably come up with some wild things and i think uh practically speaking um in the here and now 
we're already seeing some some very cool developments in in Lightning and what it offers in terms of uh, maybe improving a lot of internet services and and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, all of this makes me think about something you wrote in the piece, and I'll phrase it like this: How is Bitcoin not optional? Or I'll follow up with: Are people being sucked into the Bitcoin world? Yes, they are. There's, there's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it isn't optional because if you have any uncertainties, uh, you know, there's, a, there's going to be a natural inclination to want to alleviate those, um, and get through it. And different people are going to have different uncertainties that they're, they're dealing with, but Bitcoin is designed to alleviate sort of all of them. So if your concern is about your savings being drained, Bitcoin fixes this. If your concern is about being deplatformed, Bitcoin fixes this um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So with that in mind, like everyone has these monetary issues. Everyone has to use money. You can't not use money because we, we live in a uh, in, in an industrial society. Um, you know, it's a little bigger than, you know, the Dunbar number here that we're, we're dealing with. And we have to operate in a very large division of labor. And the way that we co coordinate within that is money. Um, and I, I, you know, I could wax poetic all day long about how great that is. Um, but the point is, is, you know, we kind of, every, everyone find them, finds themselves in need of money. And I, I would go so far to say that, that um, recently there was a uh, article in, Bitcoin Magazine, and there was a nice podcast interview as well with uh, about and with a um, monastery in Missouri. Um, so um, there, there are these nuns that accept Bitcoin uh, donations, and they also use it to save. They actually save, uh, you know, stack sats, and they hodl. And um, for for them, it's it's very much uh, for the purposes of you know building out their monastery, building a a beautiful, wonderful cathedral, et cetera, et cetera. Point being is like even even you know these nuns who live a very ascetic lifestyle, they still have to use money, and they found that for their purposes, Bitcoin is the perfect money. So if if they're sucked into it, I mean, I I guarantee you also have monetary needs where Bitcoin alleviates things um, for you. And, you know, people often talk about how, you know, in, in our Western world, you know, especially the United States, we might not feel these things as much. So there's not as much pressure. But globally, there are a lot of people around the world who have a lot more pressures on them to seek out a better monetary good. And the more that people do that, the more everyone has to, um, because you know Bitcoin grows in value, um, it grows in, and it also then grows in necessity. And so as that happens, people, people kind of have to be drawn to a better money, um, and it's it's totally plausible for the entire global monetary system to reorganize itself around Bitcoin. And as people find themselves like <laughs> aligning with that to any degree they then also become entrenched in having to preserve bitcoin so if you if you maybe bought some bitcoin in 2013 or something you're someone who was like really early and you just happen to ha like have a bunch and it was just play money it was like an interesting thing but then you wake up in 2022 and you know the price is no longer you know $10 or whatever and it's you know 17,000 or you know, you might find yourself like, oh, you have a lot of money and you need to start thinking about how to protect that. And that person, you know, their first move might be, okay, well, I need to go get a hardware wallet. Well, you've kind of like entrenched yourself in the system to, you know, give into this idea of like, oh, this is something I need to protect in the first place. Then you might think, well, I have this hardware wallet, but how do I connect to the network? And it's like, well, if you don't run a full node, you're using someone else's full node. There is no Bitcoin network beyond full nodes. It's either your node or someone else's. And that person might be like, well, here are the dangers of connecting to someone else's node, whether it's um, you can get lied to and you're not given a, a correct picture of the network, or um, there's privacy considerations where if you tell them your addresses, they can see everything about it. 
um, there's, there's a bunch of reasons why someone would then be like, well, I need to have my own full node and connect my own hardware wallet to my own full node. Um, and once again, you've like further entrenched, you've become, you've become dependent on the fact that you can use a full node and use hardware wallets and, or, you know, private keys and, you know, whatever form it is that you want to, you know, hold them point being that you are now like entrenched in that. And you've now entered a world that you can't go back from. There's no alternative to Bitcoin. It's not like you can go, oh, well, I'm going to go, um, I, you know, Bitcoin, that was fun, but I'm going to go fire up my dollar full node now. And I'm going to go back to the dollar system because I, I like that more. Um, for certain things, it's inescapable to need Bitcoin um, for certain types of uncertainties that you're facing because literally nothing else can address those very uncertainties. Yeah, I agree with everything you said there. So then uh, I want to ask you, is, is morality baked into money? That's uh, that's a very big question. Um, I think there are... I think there are connections. Um, my my honest answer is like, yes, there's like a lot of stuff, but I, I, I want to, uh, you know, try to be, try to, to, you know, address this, you know, most like, uh, you know, in the most like sincere way. One of the things, you know, it, the, the, the main thing that I think Bitcoiners talk about, um, you know, mostly stemming from Safe's book. And of course he gets this from the Austrians, um, is talking about time preference. And I do think that time preference does have a sort of, um, I, I almost think of it as a, a, a meta morality, like kind of effect on people. Because once again, like um, if, if you are dealing with a money that you literally can't save, you're going to have to make choices with that money that you may have not wanted to make ideally. And those things might drive you more towards um, wanting more consumer goods, wanting to be more in the present, um, et cetera, et cetera, because you're pushed into a situation where you have no other economic choice. When you remove that, so <laughs> you get into Bitcoin and Bitcoin fixes this, like it fixes everything. Um, it, you know, and it's, it's able to create the conditions such that people can have a lower time preference. I think we've actually witnessed, I mean, empirically speaking, I see so many people actually lowering their time preference, people actually, um, starting to acquire a good that they can feel like I'm saving this thing forever because I, I recognize the opportunity cost of letting this thing go their whole life starts to sort of reorient itself around the fact that they can do such a thing. And I've seen people say, you know, Oh, I don't, I don't smoke weed as much anymore. Um, I've started eating better. I've started, um, you know, forming a family or, um, you know, studying more people like reading books because like, suddenly it's like, wow, this is, it's like this idea that they can't stop thinking about. And so they, they suddenly find, an insatiable appetite for learning that they never had before. And all of these things are moving them towards more of a, you know, what I, I think of as a, a moral lifestyle. Um, so fr from that perspective, yeah, it's like a, a meta morality where it kind of like, I think unleashes a capacity for humans to, um, when you have good money, it unleashes the capacity to have, like more moral behavior. Whereas um, when you have a bad money, um, you are forced into nasty situations. Now you can still have, you know, a very, very holy man who, you know, despite the fact that, you know, they're, they're in completely impoverished and stuff like that, they still have perfect virtue and, you know, God bless that that guy um you know we should we should all aspire to be that person my point is more about the fact that you know we're all still you know a bunch of animals and you know respond to economic incentives and such that uh we are unfortunately not all that holy man as much as we might even uh aspire to be so um and i i think good money allows us to to free ourselves of um, having our, our hands forced towards, you know, kind of, um, behaviors that we might not otherwise want to do when suddenly we have to pay the costs for it. 
Yeah. And you, you bring up in your article, you know, how Bitcoin will bring on the establishment of a Bitcoin world order. And I, I think about morality there, but I think about order too. So do, do you think Bitcoin will bring sanity back to our lives? Yeah, I think I think in many ways, yes, for, for very much the same reasons. Like when you have a sound money, like I said, you actually have to face more opportunity costs because, you know, this is. This is why, you know, people, you know, don't want to send, spend sets, you know, often because it's like they recognize or or maybe they don't buy something because it's like if I buy this, they start thinking in terms of not just present sets, but also those present sets into the future, the purchasing power that they're, you know, they, they would be missing out on. And so that's taking the concept of opportunity cost to a level that people are simply not used to dealing with, um, I think higher than pr pretty much any human has ever dealt with. And so we have to actually think about opportunity cost. And even in a post hyper Bitcoin Bitcoinized world where, um, you know, the, the marginal utility of holding Bitcoin is not as high um, because, you know, we've kind of found a sort of monetary equilibrium, even in that case, because of its soundness, because of the fact that, um, you know, there's not that economic drag, people are still going to tend to hold Bitcoin um, more than they would have held some other monetary. So that there would be an increase in savings um, versus versus other monetary systems, especially our own. With yeah. that being said, so, yep. yeah, okay, so like um, with that kind of extreme opportunity cost, you kind of have to like sanity is forced upon you because you you suddenly you have to take stock of the choices at hand and actually think about them for once um and i think that you know encourages people to you know have a more sober appreciation um for the the um choices they're making um and i and i do think that you know creates a sort of uh sanity right do you ever think Bitcoin will be primal like gold. I think it is. <laughs> Look at all of us. We're all yeah. like, uh, we're all dancing around. There's the, you know, like the, the apes in 2001, a space odyssey around the monolith. You know, we all have that, that, that very uh, primal energy towards this very, very strange thing that's been set before us. That's a good point. Um, you know, we didn't touch on how a node also brings security, especially around data and privacy. Um, but I want to turn to some uh, some questions from Twitter. Uh, one, Jonathan Melton wants to know when your next great video is coming out, a la Stacking Sats. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, there's so much so much to do. Um, I, I I do I do enjoy making videos. Um, all the all the videos I've posted, there's basically the videos I've made. I was just kind of like learning how to use video editing software in the process. Um, and it's been a lot of fun and I do enjoy um, that sort of uh, artistic creative side. Um, so I, I hope I can, although, um, you know, I, my, my laptop uh, is getting kind of old um, because <laughs> I wanted to stack more sets instead of um, buying, buying a nice like M1 Mac or whatever. So uh, maybe one day I'll, I'll convince myself it's worth it to, uh, get the hardware to be able to handle um actually seeing through some artistic visions um until then it's also just a matter of, of uh finding the time and the and the right muse the muse has to hit you know i appreciate that noom dynamite wants to know what your favorite cold storage mechanism is whether it's a particular hardware wallet or multi-sig or something you build yourself or off the shelf uh it sounds like spook dynamite am i right Noom nice try, Dynamite. But maybe no, I I'm know. Wrong. I I know Noom Dynamite on Twitter. I'm I'm making okay. a joke because uh, you know, nice try, Feds, trying to uh, find <laughs> out everything about my uh, Bitcoin storage. Right. right. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Rob Hamilton, he's been a guest on the show. Wants to know what your top three cuts of beef are. Oh, um, ribeye is definitely number one. Um, would it be cheating to say uh, chuck eye, which is basically like the poor man's <laughs> ribeye? Um, no, there's no cheating here. <laughs> uh, I like that. Um, I'm trying to think of of what else. I mean, I I mostly stick with uh, ribeyes, uh, ribeyes and ground beef. But uh, 
Um, I, I other ribs, you know, like short ribs, are uh, you know obviously fantastic. I'm a ribeye guy myself, especially bone in. Not the tomahawk though, um, and I do like ground beef. I like burgers, like ribs. Um, moving on, I have one. I'm kind of curious. How would you feel if Satoshi was not well off or even poor? So let's say Satoshi had a regular job, took a sabbatical, produced the protocol, went back to the regular job, maybe couldn't spend any of the Satoshi's, not even for ethical reasons, just privacy reasons, uh, does, you know, for whatever reasons, and, and, and maybe can't provide as good a life for his family as, as he would like. What do you make of that? What would you make of that situation? <laughs> well, I should stack some sets. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think even in that situation, in the long run, it's obviously like if people get tripped up by the Bitcoin fixes this thing because they they assume that like everyone's talking about like Bitcoin fixing things immediately. But in the long run, um, something to consider is that when you have a good monetary system, and we go back to that product pro productivity theory of wages. The more economic capacity that that sound money unlocks so that you have more technology and more productivity and more consumer and capital goods available on the market, that means that even, even the uh, you know least well-off um, and even the people who you know maybe they're late to Bitcoin or you know whatever, it doesn't matter. All of those people benefit ultimately from the growth of the economy as a whole. Um, so... You know, that doesn't help him in the short run, uh, but maybe that helps his uh, children and grandchildren. Sure. Um, beyond that, as far as like <laughs> the privacy thing, um, I, I wouldn't know how to, I, I don't know how to, how to address that in particular. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder if uh, Satoshi does have access to coins um, or, or if uh, a lot of the mining that was done was uh, to, kind of mine it into the void, so to speak, as a bootstrapping mechanism, um, you know, because it creates this sort of necessary reserve demand if the money just can't be, can't be spent. But that's, that's pure speculation. I have, I have no clue, but, uh, you know, even if uh, Satoshi, no, no matter Satoshi's uh, position, Satoshi uh, provided us with an incredible amount of good. And uh, I don't think we could, you know, thanks Satoshi enough for uh, what what uh, he, she, they, whoever you know, alien, NSA, whoever they might be, uh, you know what what they bestowed upon humanity was just uh, for great good. So that's yeah, I just that's I, something you know, people debate can't wealth be bought. <laughs> a lot in the country. Uh, even people like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, and you know, people say, oh, Jeff Bezos has too much money, and I think about you know how much value and money and time bezos has saved humanity and people use you know his service for a reason and we can get into amazon but you know uh, i think satoshi has great created tremendous value for humanity uh, i'd like to think that he was mining to keep the network going and altruistically but maybe slipping some on the side into some account we we don't know about um i i i, I don't know i just think that this person should be partaking in the value that they created for the world uh not oh, i mean if if satoshi does have uh however many thousands and thousands of bitcoin um i think that's wonderful and uh i hope i hope satoshi benefits from it um but but even without it just uh you know even even knowing what you created like that that's right. something that <laughs> no amount of bitcoin could buy in a sense thinking about you know people who have benefited from a system whether they would knowingly, willingly, or actively a part of it. Uh, what do you think about the boomers? Do you have good things to say about the boomers? Uh, well, I I think you were listening to my my Nick Batia uh, interview because my my controversial statement from that was uh, I, I kind of I'm not I'm not totally against the boomers. Um, I do kind of like boomers. Some of them. Um, I think. <laughs> I. I you know, one of my one of my hot takes is that I think bad money has actually played a part in this sort of like generational war warfare. 
that were existing because you have this like general problem right where the boomers they had it easy you know they they came out of this like post-war boom they got you know there's all the stories of, you know all, all the jokes that millennials and zoomers have about you know the boomer showing up is like oh you don't have a job just just go go to the job and uh, speak to the boss and tell them I'll work for you, you know, and they'll just like magically give you a job or like tell you how, you know, they just, they were able to work their way through you, you youngins don't work hard. Like I worked my way through college, et cetera, et cetera. Like all these, all these things, you know, they benefited from having like a not as insane monetary system. And, you know, your average boomer, they, they're, you know, they're not the ones at the fed. They're not the ones like, setting the interest rates they might have a totally confused understanding of you know why things were good then and not good now um but so do the millennials in the sense of like you know uh once again like blaming the boomers instead of like the the federal reserve for uh you know creating artificially low interest rates and and printing money out the wazoo such that you know something like a college education is so expensive there's no reason that it ought to be should actually you know, in many ways have gotten cheaper, um, but it didn't. And it's, it's not really the boomer's fault. And so I think like both sides in a way are just missing these, these key monetary insights. And if we could all like get to the bottom of it, and I, I think both sides have something to learn from it and that there would be less of that general generational warfare. If it was like, why, like, yes, you had it easier, but why was it the fact that I, you know, didn't get it easy, you know, uh, pin it, pin it on the, uh, sort of correct shared enemy. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I, I think there's, there's, there's something like that. And, uh, you know, even then there's, and it's, you know, we could, we could talk about all the potential like reasons, but you know, there's, I, I've met a lot of good, good boomers, <laughs> you know, I like my parents. Um, and, um, you know, th there's also a lot of uh, traits that they have that, uh, you know, we, we could still learn from some of, you know, some of the boomers I've met, the level of grit that they have, mm -hmm. like it's, they're, they're not all, you know, these, uh, you know, boomers who like drive around in RVs and uh, squander their life savings with, you know, because they don't, they don't really care about actually helping, you know, their, their children or grandchildren or whatever. It's not all like that. Um, so yeah. I've just, I've met too many good boomers to, uh, have, have, uh, my feelings towards the whole generation. And once again, it's just like, I want to, I want to focus on the right enemy to me. It's like, it's, it's like I said, the, the boomers as, as misguided as many of them are, most people are misguided. And, uh, I think it's most important to focus on, you know, these, these key causal factors that have led to the degra degradation of the economy. And it was not the, it was not your norm, like normie boomer that did that. It was specifically the boomers at the fed and uh, people previous to boomers at the fed um, and, and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, that's, yeah. that's my, that's my call to uh, use Bitcoin to um, bring, bring generations back together, bring families back together and, uh, <laughs> be able to love one one another again yeah i love that i'm gonna Bitsy, i'm gonna quote you back to yourself in the end anyone who needs good money is drawn to bitcoin and anyone who's drawn to bitcoin is drawn to defending bitcoin the economic growth and the will to secure and defend bitcoin are intertwined so on that note uh if there was anyone you could orange pill in the world who would it be oh man <laughs> that's a it's an interesting question. Um, anyone in the world? I'm going to say the Pope. Really? Orange pill the Pope. Uh, why is that? Because uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of, of who has um, a kind of influence over the most people. And uh, I, I think that the you know the Pope is clearly not as uh, as influential as in times historical, but there's still you know what a billion people that look kind of generally towards that guy, and then billions more that do um, you know respect that office. I think it has enough of a a uh, high point that if uh, 
if the if the Pope was able to be orange pilled, um, a lot of of people would uh, open to it. That made me think of something there. So let's say in some magical universe, Satoshi could appear and be safe. Would Satoshi have great power in the world as an individual? Not so much through monetary form, but like in terms of communication, uh, like the way the Pope has a, a pedestal? I, I don't think it would be the same way. Um, just because like Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't, um, you know, the, the relationship, I guess, like in the, uh, I don't want Bitcoin religion. It's uh, contradictory. Not so here, much from but, a religious perspective, just, but, but from like the, just the nature of the, the Bitcoin network, like the Satoshi, it doesn't matter what he says. Satoshi could come back and, uh, say all mm. kinds of, mm. um, dumb things like, uh, you know, people who claim to be Satoshi or want to do, um, the, the real Satoshi could also say dumb things, but it's just like the 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 network wouldn't care. Um, you know, there there might be social influence, um, but I just I I don't think that as far as like actually like node software around the world is not going to like suddenly change. Um, it would it would be extremely difficult for even Satoshi um, to be able to do it. That's why Bitcoin is so great is because um, it, it, you can't be like swayed. However, like the the sort of uh, you know epistemology or like I don't know philosophical structure, so to speak, of you know various you know actual religions. Um, are, are such that, you know, I, I think there are different levels of influence that actually exist, you know, in, in terms of the Pope, if the Pope <laughs> says something, um, you know, by, by certain standards, uh, the, the Pope is considered infallible by a, a rather large group of people. And therefore it would, you know, actually shape uh, how people, how, how people view things. So I think, uh, you know, Satoshi would not have uh, a, a Pope-like, uh, influence over Bitcoin, he would he would have to be a a plebe like the rest of us, and win on grounds of of correctness and um, <laughs> good memes um, <laughs> rather than um, uh, merely having like kind of what you're imagining, where where it's just like by virtue of being Satoshi does not grant him special gifts. I don't think. Yeah, I just uh, I wasn't imagining it, but I, I did want to ask it. But um... I, I think he would get a lot of followers very quickly, <laughs> right? <via> of... <laughs> Especially on Twitter. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's that's what I mean. It's like uh, his his Twitter account would would uh, become one of the most popular probably overnight. Um, but <laughs> as to the actual effects of his words, um, I don't think he has the same sort of uh, relationship to the network. Uh, for various reasons, as as different religious leaders uh, do, and and that's also just to be clear, not not saying anything yeah. good or bad about those those structures. I'm just saying that they're different. Yeah, I think it's a great point. So I'm going to read one quote from Mises, and then final question for you. In the theory of money and credit, published in 1912, Mises wrote. <laughs> Thus, the requirements of the market have gradually led to the selection of certain commodities as, com as common media of exchange. The group of commodities from which these were drawn was originally large and differed from country to country, but has more and more contracted. Whenever a direct exchange seemed out of the question, each of the parties to a transaction would naturally endeavor to exchange his superfluous commodities, not merely for marketable commodities in general, but for the most marketable commodities. And among these, again, he would naturally prefer whichever particular commodity was the most marketable of all. The greater the marketability of the goods first acquired in indirect exchange, the greater would be the prospect of being able to reach the ultimate objective without further maneuvering. Thus, there would be inevitable tendency for the less marketable of the series of goods used as media of exchange to be one by one rejected until at last only a single commodity remained which was universally employed as a medium of exchange. In a word, money. I would paraphrase and say Bitcoin. 
Your subtitle to the article, How Bitcoin Obsoletes Inflation and Promotes Human Flourishing. So my final question for you is, is Bitcoin a strategy for world peace? Uh, yes, in, in the sense that um, Bitcoin, by virtue of its economic properties, its physical properties, um, and the way that it solves monetary problems like nothing else could, creates a natural draw to it by anyone who needs to use a, a money um, that, that overcomes those. And over time, that marketability grows and grows and has the most capacity to, to absorb that marketability because of all of the different kinds of uncertainties that Bitcoin can reduce, that gold can't, that fiat can't, that shells and cows and whatever else, none of them could. And as it does that, it, um, it, it solves the problem of counterfeit and double spending you know, that that kind of underpins uh, uh, you know all of these uncertainties. It solves you know kind of problems of ownership, um, et cetera, et cetera. As it does this, when it solves those problems, it does not just solve it for petty criminals, um, but for all instances of double spending, counterfeit, et cetera. And so. No, no matter how large of an institution you might be with however much institutional, maybe even physical power that you have, it's basically impossible for you to just like point a gun at a full node and get it to um, change how it's calculating, how it's running the numbers. Um, and so, I mean, obviously you can, <laughs> you can point a gun at someone's head to run a node, um, a certain way. Um, but yeah, you know, there's a lot of ways that they could continue to run proper full nodes. And um, because of this, and because of this growing marketability and this growing capacity to um, prevent these kinds of monetary crimes at any scale, means that um, a society is sort of in the process, developing the skills to prevent this now and forever as a whole and becoming more entrenched in such a system that uses this kind of money such that I think that uh, in many ways, so not only economically, but ideologically, people would be drawn to Bitcoin and the protection thereof, the protection of their own Bitcoin um, at the very least. And um, with that, it, uh, it, it it changes a lot of the sort of uh, foundational uh, the, the foundations of civilization by like closing up these these attack vectors. There would be less drag on the economy, which would open up more economic capacity, um, which would compound itself because there wouldn't be, you you stop inflation, which allows people to have more savings to do as they please. On the other hand, when you've stopped inflation, you've also um, decreased the power of parasitic firms like the state um, to continue their operations the way that they have. So that would sort of you know defund. What that also means is the money that they were using to then further kind of like win over public opinion also go down. And so they can't, you know, they, they kind of, <laughs> they take your money so they can pay people to like make you feel bad if you don't like people taking your money and so on and so forth. It's, it's really perverse. Um, but like all of that um, would shrink. And um, as that happens, uh, society has just, it, it's grown wealthier. It's grown more resilient um and uh with all that you're 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 also creating a an environment where it pays more just just like you know uh, it pays more to be an honest miner it also just pays more to be an honest economic actor because the cost of being able to get away with a double spend or a counterfeit is very high and so you're always reduced to 
the brute force mechanisms. And uh, as I described, I also think that it would greatly limit your ability to sway public opinion. And so people who are caught up in uh, structures of, I don't know, structures of anti-production, I suppose you could call it, um, would, would have to uh, presumably move towards actual productive ventures. And so, um, you know, all of that in general is, um, you know, any piece of that is society moving in a more peaceful direction. Wow. Um, I mean, Fitzina, I have to be honest. Uh, I don't have heroes uh, besides my dad. Uh, I'm trying to be a hero to my own kids. Um, but if I had a Mount Rushmore of uh, Bitcoin, you would be on it. Um, I look up to, you know, ideas and and you've gotten ideas across uh, to me that has just been very important and, and to how I think about Bitcoin and and even a lot of things outside of Bitcoin. You speak about public opinion and people caught up in anti-productive uh, ventures. And I mean, even your appearance on um, what Bitcoin did and uh, just around uh, and we talked a bit about it on on our show in episode 34, but just around, you know, putting your time into the public sphere and what you can get out of that and, and the diminishing returns uh, has just been incredibly influential in my life. Um, I, I, I really appreciate the work you've been putting out uh, since before I haven't even been a Bitcoiner. Uh, I love your profile pic. Uh, that was kind of inspirational. I even had something like that when I started out as a NIM. And, um, you know, your appearance at BitBlock Boom um, was the first time I really felt Bitcoin in, in the physical world in terms of uh, other people speaking about it and feeling it viscerally outside of code and the network and what it could do for me digitally um, in, in the 21st century. So I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I'll leave it to you for any parting words and to let people know where they could find you. Yeah, well, I, first of all, I mean, I'm I'm flattered and honored and humbled by the the very kind words. So, um, uh, thank you, thank you so much for the kind words, and uh, I'm I'm really glad that I've been able to, uh, you know, provide you with that kind of value. Um, I, I do I do hope you know I'm I'm trying to be but but a mere vessel, uh, like I'm, <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you. Um, as far as uh, where people can find me, um, Twitter. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Bitstein. Um, I, as you said at the beginning, I've started a Substack, uh, the Bits, Bits, bleh, sorry, the Bitstein Brief at bitstein.substack.com. Uh, people can visit the Nakamoto Institute. Satoshi Nakamoto Institute is at nakamotoinstitute.org, and um, the Noted Bitcoin Podcast is at noted.org, but can be found on uh, podcast apps everywhere. I think everywhere. So that that would be, I think those that kind of covers uh, that and uh, yeah, yeah man. Uh, fa failure to stack sats is not an option. Don't left don't be left behind. Uh, Vicine, this has been tremendous and so dope. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Really had a good time. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. Again, make sure that you're subscribed to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast so you don't miss out on any fresh and new content. I'd love to hear your feedback. Leave a comment or send me an email to cedricyoungman at gmail.com. Let me know what you think and if you have any guest suggestions. Thanks to my friend Bitstein for taking the time to come on the show. I also want to thank our sponsors, River Financial, CoinKite, the Bitcoin Conference, and CrowdHealth for powering the show. Huge shout out and much appreciation to those of you who are streaming and boosting the show for Sats on the Found app. Big up to the boost legend himself, Eric99, who boosted my rip with Joe Consorti 50,000 Sats and wrote, Stay Humble, Stack Sats. Your continued and consistent support keeps me going, my friend. Lawrence Lepard, Susie BDDS, Alexander Leishman, Eric Kaysen, Greg Zaj, Clemenza from the Meat Mafia, Nozomi Hayesi, and Eric Weiss are up next. Stay humble, stack sats, and get laser focused out there. This is Cedric. Peace. Peace.